Hello everyone! Today's video is kind of an unplanned one. I'm going to share a few quick personal thoughts on 1978's Star Trek The Motion Picture, directed by Robert Wise. This is the first of six Star Trek films made with the original cast of the TV series, which ran for three seasons from 1966 to 1969. In this motion picture debut, Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and the rest of the gang are reunited when a vast, deadly cloud moving toward Earth threatens to wipe it out entirely, and the Enterprise is sent to investigate the cloud and, if possible, prevent disaster. The screenplay was written by Harold Livingston from a story by Alan Dean Foster based on Gene Roddenberry's creation. You may be aware that this film's got a negative reputation. For years I heard it described as boring and slow, and it's the only one of the six original cast films that I didn't see as a child because my siblings were never interested in re-watching it. I have always intended to see it eventually, but I wasn't in a big rush. But recently, my friend Dice K. Beppu announced on his channel that he would be doing a series of livestream discussions going through these six films, beginning with, of course, Star Trek The Motion Picture. That first livestream is going to occur on Sunday, February 6th at 7 a.m. Tokyo time. What time that is for you, uh, you have to figure out, but I can tell you that in the United States, that's Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Dice K is a lifelong Star Trek fan, and I'm sure it's going to be a fun, in-depth discussion. But listening to his announcement, I realized that if I really wanted to follow along, I needed to see the film. So I did. And I really liked it. Yes, there are parts that are slow, but the film's pace overall is consistent. It's not like there are a couple exciting action scenes and then suddenly it comes to a grinding halt. And you've got to have some perspective. This was a long-awaited resurrection of Star Trek, a long-desired return of a beloved cast from a too-soon-canceled show. Thus, the filmmakers wanted to take a little extra time to shine a spotlight on certain things for the devoted, loyal fans who helped bring it back. The long reveal of the new Enterprise, for example. That starship is iconic, and they wanted to show her off in all her glory, with spiffy new effects to dazzle and impress. And the effects do impress. There are some shots earlier on that don't look so hot. Green screen outlines are obvious, uh, there's maybe too much packed into the frame, and when things get too busy it's like your eyes and your brain aren't sure what to focus on. But otherwise, this film is a feast for the eyes. We watched it on Blu-ray, which is kind of a rare event for me anyway, and it was the theatrical cut, by the way, and it looks good. Director Robert Wise wasn't a stranger to science fiction. I talked a little about his early work in my video about Val Luton films in October. Wise was a remarkably varied director who was an editor at RKO, working on Citizen Kane, among other films, and he graduated from the editing department when he was chosen as a replacement director on The Curse of the Cat People. Producer Val Luton so liked his work that he then chose him to direct The Body Snatcher in 1945, and with that success, Wise's future was set. He went on to direct 40 films, including The Sound of Music, West Side Story, and The Haunting, but also 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still and 1971's The Andromeda Strain, both science fiction classics. I can also see the influence of other films that predate this one in this cultural wave of science fiction. The influence of 1968's 2001 A Space Odyssey seems unmistakable, especially in the sequence where Spock ventures out in the spacesuit and the screen is dominated by his face in the helmet and the reflection of what he's seeing on the visor. And as it turns out, there's even more to it than that. The special photographic effects director on Star Trek The Motion Picture was Douglas Trumbull, who was also the special photographic effects director on 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Blade Runner, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and The Andromeda Strain. <laughs> 
And if we go in the opposite direction, I strongly suspect that Star Trek The Motion Picture was an influence on Independence Day. There's a part here involving a tractor beam where we approach an immense alien ship, and we have a great shot establishing size differential, and we get a mesmerizing and prolonged look at the structure. Multiple things about this sequence reminded me of Independence Day, namely the scene where Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum are pulled into the mothership and we get a glimpse of its inner workings. So here's yet another movie that Roland Emmerich might have stolen his imagery from, but you know, no matter what, I will always love Independence Day. There were parts in this film where I sat there like, whoa, what just happened? The wormhole sequence, for instance, which is pretty random if you think about it, the scene where the probe shows up and checks out the bridge, and the horrifyingly suggestive scene in the transporter room where two beings struggle to beam aboard. That was nightmarish. Personally, I didn't find the lengthier sequences as tiresome as some people make them sound. Yes, I did have one or two very brief moments when I felt my eyelids getting heavy, but that does not necessarily mean that I was bored. <laughs> I feel like my eyelids get heavy uh, at one point in every other movie I watch. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> but I think that that aspect of it has been exaggerated. Especially if you only saw this movie as a kid, those sequences may have seemed longer than they really were. They probably felt endless. Um, because it's a lot to ask a child to sit through something like that, where nothing's happening and you're supposed to just marvel at the visuals, take in the Enterprise from every possible angle, and listen to the music, which opens up into its own symphony here. The music composed by Jerry Goldsmith is great. Not as good as James Horner's Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan score, in my opinion, but this score has some beautiful cues and motifs, and it's got the grandiose call to adventure that I've come to expect from these soundtracks. The main theme here is the one that later came to be recognized as the Next Generation's theme. There are moments when Goldsmith makes really nice use of the pipe organ. I like the nod to the original show's theme in sections where Kirk does the captain's log, and I'm intrigued by the sound effect or cue associated with the cloud with V'ger. Um, I didn't look this up, but it sounds like it could have been created with piano strings? Amplified piano strings? I don't know. Every time it showed up, though, I thought, ooh, I like that. <laughs> Uh, I do think the costumes are... <laughs> they're not flattering, especially to the men, though the women's uniforms are actually an improvement on what they had to wear before in terms of practicality. And for some reason, Dr. McCoy, whose uniform was often a bit different, is wearing something that looks particularly 70s. My main impression is that it looks like everyone's wearing pajamas, which is hilarious. Um, I'm not fond of the bland, earth tone color palette either. The beiges and pale blue-grays are so different from the striking red uniforms introduced in Star Trek II, which are more militaristic and official looking than these casual garments. They also must have tested better with audiences since the cast continued to wear them throughout the film series. Still, some uniforms are better than others. Kirk's, for example, isn't bad, and partway through some characters get to change, and that's a plus, though Kirk's second uniform looks sort of like something he might wear on a yachting trip. But as far as the plot goes, I found it engaging. It's a mystery, there's a palpable threat, we see alarming things happen, and the visuals are so trippy and mesmerizing, especially the ones where you feel like you're journeying through a retro Windows screensaver, that it makes you tense up in anticipation of what will appear next. There are a few things here that are a little strange, but I liked the twist and the existential, philosophical questioning aspect of it was interesting, 
And if you've been watching this channel for a while and you're familiar with the concept revealed in the final part of the film, well, hello. <laughs> of course I'd find that intriguing. Um, oh, by the way, it's interesting to note that in the end titles, Isaac Asimov is credited as Special Science Consultant. There is one particular aspect of the resolution I find weird. <laughs> In a way, it's it's nice, even romantic, but also like, so what's really happening? <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, if you don't think about it too much, it's fine. And it's just so nice to see the band getting back together. There's lots of time spent on that, about as much time as is given to Kirk gazing in admiration at the Enterprise. But I also like that everybody's thrown off a bit at first. There's some strangeness between them. When we first meet Kirk, he's deadly serious about the imminent threat facing Earth. He's also challenged regarding his insistence on taking command of the Enterprise himself, even though he hasn't been in that position in years and isn't up to date on the renovations. McCoy's grumpy because he's just been dragged away from... I don't know what, but it takes time for him to warm up, and Spock has just failed a Vulcan ritual because he can't jettison his human emotions, so he's trying to suppress them, which means when he unexpectedly shows up and everyone, even McCoy, gives him a warm welcome, his response is cold and distant. Tension between characters and questioning of Spock's motives keeps us from seeing the main trio the way we're used to. But then when normalcy resumes, it's that much nicer to re-experience the charm of that three-way dynamic. This movie doesn't have as much humor as some of the other ones, especially Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, which is just full of gems, but it does have funny lines and interactions, like when there's a big build-up to the reveal of the Enterprise Bridge, but it's a disorganized mess, or when V'ger startles everyone by bursting through the door, or when Kirk keeps inviting Spock to sit down and Spock ignores the offer, so finally, in exasperation, Kirk says, Spock, will you please? sit down. Or when Kirk's about to get mad and dispute Decker's point, and then he realizes what he's saying is true, and he changes gears with a rueful smile. By the way, Decker is an interesting character to get to know because he's totally justified in feeling the way he does, but we've got these built-in loyalties, so we're inclined to side with Kirk, the character we know. I ended up liking how they resolve their differences, with professionalism and mutual respect. It is odd to me, however, that they chose the name Decker. It immediately calls to mind Commodore Decker from the Doomsday Machine, which is one of the most famous episodes of the original series, so I'm surprised they went with a familiar name. It's impressive that even though it's a full-length film, it somehow mimics the structure and feel of an hour-long episode of the original show. The opening hook, the characters' dilemmas, the nature of the main problem, even the way the final scene is executed. It's all very Star Trek, and the film managed to give the fans so much that was fresh and new, including debuting the new Klingon look, while maintaining a familiarity that made it feel like everyone just picked up where they left off. It's not so unusual to us now, but the idea of a TV show's entire cast coming back ten years later to make a film was not common back then. There's something experimental about this, and obviously, since they went on to make five more movies, some of which were even better, uh, the experiment was a success. The actors didn't forget how to play their roles, the chemistry is still there, the music's a perfect match, and the story fits. That's why it works. If you give it a chance. I, for one, enjoyed the movie, and I'm grateful to Dice K, even though he didn't know it, for spurring me on, and if you can make it, I hope you'll tune in to his chat about the film this weekend. Again, that is Sunday, 7 a.m. Tokyo time, uh, Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, the internet has... Uh, time converters so you can find out, okay, if it's this time here, in this time zone, what time will that be for me? It's great. I 
stink at doing time zone conversion stuff. Ugh. Um, so I will be watching. Uh, I don't know how active I'll be in the chat because I'm a lurker on any channel but my own, but I will be watching and maybe I'll say a little bit here and there. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm curious to hear what you think about this film if you've seen it, so go ahead and share your thoughts in the comments below and I'll be back later. Thanks for watching.